the civil disobedience. The morning of January 15, 1976, started out like any other day in the Skyline neighborhood of Southeast San Diego. But there were two special things that set this day apart. For one, it was the day before my 14th birthday. Secondly, it was the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, and we were determined to make it a holiday. There had been a movement to make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. African Americans all over the country started celebrating before it became a legal holiday. One of the things that appealed to me was that my birthday was on January 16th, one day after Dr. King's and one day before Muhammad Ali. <laughs> this movement would last another 10 years. Civil rights had always been a favorite topic of mine. For growing up in San Diego, I had lived in Pacific Beach, Skyline, and was currently being bused to a school in Sierra Mesa. I saw firsthand how blacks were treated differently from one side of town to the other. My parents grew up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They were not vocal activists, yet they never stopped reminding us how different life for us would be as black people, especially in dealing with police or figures of authority. Without the knowledge of my parents, I planned to ditch school for a special event. Luckily, I lived in Skyline, and I only had to walk about two miles to Martin Luther King Park to take part in my first expression of civil disobedience. As the day went on, hundreds of people flocked to the park, some skipping school, some skipping work, whole families participating. The smell of barbecue filled the air. There were local bands playing, along with ministers, politicians, and my favorite, plenty of girls. Everyone was feeling good about it, and with as much fun as I was having, I kept wondering how my parents would feel when they found out that I had skipped school for this. The only bad part of the day was that I was poor. I had no money to eat, and as the day became late, I knew I would never be able to walk home. My plan was just to ask anyone I see to help me with some change so that I might be able to ride the bus home. While I was out panhandling to get home, I looked across the street and at this time, there were no homes across the street on Skyline Drive from the park. Just very high canyon hills. And lined along the tops of these hills looked like every police officer in San Diego standing there next to their cars, holding rifles, and looking through binoculars. Minor feelings of regret and fear began to seep into my brain that only a few hours earlier had channeled the mentality of Dr. King, Malcolm X, Gandhi, and even Nat Turner all rolled up in one. Then the fear rose up again. By the time I finally had enough money to get on the bus and go home, darkness had covered the hills of Skyline. The music groups had disbanded, the barbecue pits had been extinguished, and all the politicians and ministers had left for the safety of their homes. But I did it. it took nearly four hours, but I had 50 cents to ride the bus home. I began my last few minutes at the park waiting for the eastbound number 11 bus. Confident that after I explained to my parents the reason for my and meaning of my disobedience, that I would only absorb pride from them. The bus began its approach to MLK Park, and I reached into my pocket to organize the measly 50 pennies it took me to, hours to gather. Not noticing that only the thugs, drunks, junkies, and all around badasses were the only ones at the bus stop with me. <laughs> and, um, the uh, driver, a young Mexican woman, was surprised as I was once she opened the door. About 30 people rushed onto the bus, none of them paying, all while yelling obscenities at the driver. Move this bus, bitch! What the fuck you waiting for, S.A.? What, you must want your ass kicked. I haven't heard one brother say, you don't move this motherfucker, I'm gonna come up there and do it for you. <laughs> My mind thought, who the heck are these people? What happened to the spirit of the unborn holiday? What would Rosa Parks do in this situation? <laughs> Shoot. I believe she would have did just what I was about to do. I was the last person to enter the bus, and I took all that change I procured during the day and put it in the receptacle that showed that I paid for this ride. But right behind me was the San Diego Police Department in full force. I took the last seat available right behind the bus driver, Feeling good about myself because I was the only one who had paid on that bus. I hadn't said a word. I just hoped that this would be over soon so I could go home. So I took out my afro pick, the one with the black fist, and began shaping my little afro. Yeah, I had hair back then. <laughs> By this time, the police were receiving every indecent verbal insult imaginable. 
Fuck you, you swine motherfuckers. Pigs ain't shit. Get your cracker asses out of here. The barrage went on for about five minutes, and then very quietly, the officer standing right in front of me, whom I'll never forget, for he had the pinkest skin I had ever seen, and his full fat face carpeted a mustache just like a walrus. <laughs> he looked down at me and said, what did you say? I hadn't said anything, so I tried to ignore him again. What did you say? I looked him dead in his eyes and said, without any expression, nothing. I didn't say a, and before I could get the rest out of my mouth, he had me, he had me by the neck, forcing me off the bus with his brute strength. At this time, the people on the bus exploded in violence, kicking windows out, running each other over, jumping over seats, trying to get off the bus and avoid all the other police. I figured I'd wake them out, then go home. The officer who grabbed me finally rustled me off the bus where I thought I would, he would let me go. But I'd done nothing wrong. I was the only one who paid. <laughs> Instead, I was placed in another chokehold and had my face bounced off the side of the bus a couple of times, handcuffed and then thrown in the back of a squad car about 20 feet behind the bus. And back then, the buses had a real window that wrapped around the back and I could see everything happening. Now the scariest thing I had seen in my life up to this point, there was one brother left on the bus way in the back with about 10 cops approaching him. He takes the most convincing karate stance I'd ever seen. <laughs> the cops hesitated, but kept approaching. The lead cop seemed scared, but inch by inch, closer and closer he came, and right behind him was the only female cop on the scene. Once they were close enough, the brother took the offensive and threw a straight right at the lead cop. He ducked, and the female cop took the punch square in the jaw. From that point on, all I could do was pray for that black man. <laughs> they beat him. They beat him with clubs, guns, boots, and whatever else they could hold and swing. I could hear every blow that man took from those angry police officers. Every blow to his body made a blunt thud. And, uh, and it reverberated through my eardrums and the sound of those wooden clubs against his skull cracked like the sound of a baseball bat connecting with a 90 mile per hour fastball. Before they finished, I felt as though I could feel each blow on my own body. I squirmed and tried to move out of the way of every blow. And then the strangest thing, the world went silent. The screaming faded out. All the people running with expressions of fear kept running without making any noise. The only sound was the, the thud and crack of those clubs connected to that young man's body. Doom, 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 crack, 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 for what seemed like an eternity. It was not until his, he seemed lifeless that they stopped. After a couple of minutes of delay in which I thought he was dead, the police picked up his beaten body and dragged him to the car I had been detained in. And literally, after literally throwing him on the back seat on top of me, the brother uh, mustered up enough strength through countless bumps and bruises that I could literally see growing from under his skin to say, what up, little homie? <laughs> and with amazement and relief, my trembling voice was like, what's up, man? <laughs> so the next morning, I'm waking up on my 14th birthday inside a concrete room painted dull white over a standard brick pattern along the walls. The next thing to catch my attention was a stainless steel toilet sink combo that sat way too close to the bed. When I saw that, I said to myself, Michael, you're really in trouble now. My body trembled when I thought of how long I would be locked up in here. Fear began to grip me like a chokehold and barely let me breathe for what seemed like hours after I woke up. Just then, just as a sense of hopelessness began to take over, the loud clang of keys rattled outside my door and it swung open. A guard looked in and said, are you Michael? I said, yes I am, I replied. Follow me and stay to the right of that yellow line and don't say a word. The officer led me through a series of hallways, one looking exactly like the other. All of a sudden at another doorway, just like the hundreds or so I had been seeing, he stops me, rattles those keys again, opens the door, and it was like the gates of heaven opening up to greet me. There sat my mother and father, along with a white man in a cheap suit and an old briefcase. 
I was set down across the table from my parents while the public defender sat at the end of the table. I kept my head down for as long as I could, fearing the looks I would get from my parents. Would it be disappointment? I think I could live with that. Or would it be the look both of them had just before the belts came off and the serious ass whooping started? <laughs> I didn't believe I could ever look them in the eyes again. I had lied about going to school, ditched school, found myself in the company of thugs and been arrested. I knew they would hate me for life. Finally, I looked at my mother, whose eyes were red from crying, wet and dry tear stains her full cheeks. When I glanced at my father, he didn't say a word, but the look in his eyes gave me a sense of calm. I saw no disappointment, disappointment, only relief that his son was all right. Then this opens the floodgates of my eyes and I began to cry like a baby. At the end of the best and the worst day of my life, my parents still had nothing but love for me. Eventually, life returned to normal. Even though I was charged with inciting a riot, disturbing the peace, and resisting arrest, <laughs> the charges were dropped. But the way I looked at the world would change forever. To this day, I have never fully trusted a police officer. I began to see them as an occupying force in the neighborhood, more of a street gang than law enforcement. And it's hard to attend, and also, my view of black people changed as well. It's hard to attend any event such as concerts and plays without thinking, which one of us is going to fuck up this peaceful event? <laughs> and as far as that man who got beat up on that bus that day, I had never seen him before, and I haven't seen him since. Thank you for listening. Michael,